Dean, so good to see everybody this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to have you tuning in with us this morning for the latest segment in our ongoing series, of Friday Morning Conversations, as we highlight really innovative education leaders, cutting edge education ideas from all across the state and all across uh, the country. Um, and despite many of the challenges that so many families, students and educators um, are facing during the pandemic, we've been really impressed by how K-12 education leaders and post-secondary education leaders are responding and also how they remain really firmly focused on creating even greater opportunities for students, both now and in the future. And in the spirit of SCORE's commitment and our mission that we really seek to catalyze innovative change and in alignment with our core values as an organization that many of the most difficult challenges in education can be solved through creative and innovative solutions, we wanna highlight innovators, entrepreneurs, leaders from really all across the country who are leading the way forward. And so our goal is to pick a single topic each time we have these conversations, a single cutting edge idea, and to really dig deep and dive deep uh, to quickly learn more um, and hear from leading entrepreneurs and innovators uh, to hopefully trigger some thoughts and ideas that you can take away and apply in your own daily work. I know how busy everyone is, so our plan is to keep these sessions brief and informal. We will be done this morning, no later than 9.15 uh, Central Time. Uh, and just would say at the beginning, we'll be taking questions throughout. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat box as we go throughout the conversation this morning. And I'll plan to get to as many as I can before we finish the conversation. So this morning, I'm really excited to welcome Ann Wicks with the George W. Bush Institute to talk a bit about the work she and her team are doing, particularly in supporting uh, students from education to the workforce and thinking about how things like data and accountability help to support students across that. Um, Anne and her team are really leaning in in many ways on connecting early childhood, K-12, higher education and workforce data for even better information and decision-making by educators and policymakers. And I'm really excited to learn more about the work this morning and, and particularly how it can help to support and inform education accountability, workforce readiness, and, and so many other areas that we know are important uh, for students. So let me quickly introduce Ann and then we'll get right to it. Uh, Ann Wicks is the Director of Education Reform at the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas, where she develops and oversees the policy research and engagement work of the Institute's Education Reform. Uh, before joining the Bush Institute and served as an associate dean at the University of Southern California School of Education and earlier held roles at Teach for America, uh, the Packard Foundation for Children's Health and at Stanford University. Um, she has an undergraduate degree and a master's degree from Stanford and also taught eighth grade social studies and has an MBA from the University of Southern California. And just as a quick fun fact, uh, and as a former captain of Stanford's women's volleyball team, was part of three national championship teams too as a player, and won, I believe, as an assistant coach. Uh, so we're really excited, and to have you with us this morning. And, and maybe just to kick us off, why don't you start perhaps sharing an overview of the important work you're doing, um, uh, what the Education Reform Initiative is thinking about and focus on right now, and then perhaps a bit of the detail around some of the education and workforce pipeline uh, work that the um, that the Bush Center has uh, been focused on, and Ann, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. I'm always happy to get the chance to chat with our friends from Tennessee. Um, I take every excuse I can to come visit your fine state. Uh, so I'm I'm really thrilled to talk about this. So if you if you're not familiar with the George W. Bush Institute, we're part of the Presidential Center. President and Mrs. Bush established once they transitioned from. White House life back into private life after sort of uh, decades now of public service. They wanted to continue working on issues that matter to them. Happily for us, education is one of them. Uh, opportunity and workforce is part of what we do. How do we make sure that all Americans are on track for opportunity? So when you think of the work that we do in our education reform team includes a lot on accountability. How do we use data? How do we connect that to a purpose and opportunity for people? How do we develop the right kind of leaders um, in our school system to actually deliver results for kids? So happy to talk about the education and workforce pipeline, which is a tool we started building 
pre-COVID, which seems like it's hard to remember a time when we weren't really thinking about the impact of the pandemic on kids. But I, I think we were a little bit lucky to actually start building this in the pre, the before times as we call it, uh, because it's really helped illustrate um, the need for robust data. We hear a lot, we talk with education wonks all the time, right? We're talking about accountability. We talk about data and data systems. And what we often miss, I think, in that is why? Why on earth do we care about that so much? Sort of, we've lost the thread on why we care. Um, and the whole point of all of that discussion around end sizes and what do you measure and what do you don't measure and what matters and what, what you know, why do we disaggregate data in this way and that way? Is we're really trying to understand if our public system is preparing kids for their next step. So if you're a third grader, are you being prepared for fourth grade? Are you, if you're leaving the high school system, are you being prepared for higher ed or what's next? All with the point of, do we have young people with real opportunity and agency in their lives so that they can support themselves, support their families in the way that we'd all hope for the people we know and love and that we would hope for all Americans um, that, that we're looking at. So that's kind of the big, the big idea. If you wanna throw up the slides, I can take you through quickly um, just some of the big questions we had in developing the pipeline tool. Um, I'll let you go to the next slide. That's, there, that's our front door if you're in the museum side and coming to visit us in the museum side. The Institute sits in the back half. But when we started this work in 2019, we were really thinking about two big questions. Are your state's young people on track for what we call prosperous self-determined lives? And a lot of times you'll hear since all the action in, first, in education is at the state level. Um, you, this is when you can get a lot of good sound bites. Yes, of course, we're on track here and we have a win here and we have a success here. But when you really ask folks, how do you know? How do you know if your state's young people are on track? You're gonna have a, it's a harder time to get your hands around those answers. And so that's, that's really where we started um, in this project, talking with a number of state leaders across the country, people who've done this, been trying to do this, uh, but had real responsibility to deliver results, the kinds of things that they were grappling with. So those were our two big questions. If you go to the next slide, talk a little bit about, just to give you a sense of the scope of this. I think a lot of us know this pretty, you know, generally. If we think about pre-COVID, we know there's about 50 million kids, give or take, enrolled in pre-K to um, 12 in public school in the U.S. That's coming from 2019 NCES. So it's about, you know, we're about that level um, right now. Uh, according to our NAEP scores in 2019, again, this is pre-COVID, only about 32.5% of eighth graders were proficient if we average that across math and reading, right? So if you apply that rate broadly to those 50, 51 million kids, you've got about 16.5 million who are on track, and that leaves us with 34.5 million eighth graders in 2019 who are really at risk of not being successful in their next level. And so when you think about it, those are, those are broad, those are broad applications. I wanna be clear, like we are broadly applying those rates. That, that gives us a sense of the scale and the scope of the kids who are probably not getting what they need to be really successful. Next, so when you look at this slide, why does this matter, right? Why do we, why, like, okay, what does this really mean? We know of almost 60% of kids, uh, or excuse me, 60% of jobs require some post-secondary education and training, whether that's a two or four year degree, as you can see there, but a lot of times now we're also seeing they need a credential, the certificate, some additional education beyond high school, um, but that really matters for most of the jobs out there when you hear about a skilled workforce. And you can see in that second chart on the right, the occupations that require a bachelor's degree, you're, you're earning about 92% more, right? You can see that's a little bit small there. I apologize for if the, those of you like me who are like wishing I had my reading glasses on. Um, when you get up to that top level at about almost 85,000, that's if you've got a master's degree or higher. But if you're at a high school diploma, you're about 35,000. Those are labor statistics, Bureau of Labor Statistic numbers. And if you move up into your associates or bachelors, you can see you make up almost, a, it's a, a little over a $20,000 jump into that associate's degree at 58,000, another 10 when you add the bachelor's degree. There's real economic agency for people when they go beyond that high school diploma in terms of their formal education. So if you go to the next slide, you see that we have just a, this massive lost opportunity, which we don't want across our country. You certainly don't want it in your state, right? 
Um, so what is happening then over time when those gaps persist? When that third grader we talk about, you hear a lot of times that we talk about third grade reading. Some if kids are behind in third grade reading, or you've got an eighth grader who's trailing in math. Those are these key gateway moments for kids as they go through that pipeline of early childhood into K-12 up into higher ed and beyond. Um, and we wanted to see what matters. So what, what happens when they get behind? They're gonna eventually become young adults. What are they ready to do? Will they really have that opportunity to support themselves? And we think about these questions, right? Who's gonna fill the skilled jobs for you? Who's gonna enlist? Who's gonna vote? Who's gonna volunteer and serve others in your community? Who's gonna pay taxes? Who's gonna become an entrepreneur and create opportunity for others in their community? All those things that you need people with enough skill, enough knowledge to have real agency and choice to pursue opportunities for themselves. So go ahead to the next slide. So when we built this tool, if you go into it, I put the link or that it's just pipeline.bushcenter.org. Um, what we're really looking for here is what could we learn by analyzing state data? So our pipeline tool has outcome data at the state level. It's a kind of big flow data, but we looked for outcomes from early childhood into K-12, higher ed and beyond. If we worked our way back down that pipeline, if we assume we want young people to be ready to be employed and support themselves and have real choice, what, what's happening to them if we go back through that pipeline? We'll see things typically like um, third grade reading scores where you'll see disaggregated by race, that kids are, uh, there's kids that are struggling. Somehow we kind of smooth that out around high school graduation. We graduate just about everybody at the same rate now around high school graduation, which is, which is good. But those gaps we see in third grade reading start to reemerge when you look at higher ed attainment, which then aligns to wage. So something is going on, right, where we're not, we're not sustaining progress for people. It makes us, you know, we have to look closely at our, what are we actually giving people in high school diplomas? Are those real? Are they giving them real agency and opportunity? So one of the things we wanted to do is have a place, if you go to pipeline.bushcenter.org, you can compare states. You can compare Tennessee, any state you want. We're updating and adding data and we're adding some new content which will come out in the next couple of months. So we'll make sure this gets back to you all if you have an interest in seeing the, the brand new version that's coming out shortly. Um, we have some bright spots that we wanted to learn from some states that have made improvement in those areas. So for example, we have a case study around Mississippi and the work that they've done around numeracy and literacy. We have a case study around Virginia, which has managed to grant more degrees to adults um, in the last several years and other places, so look, anchored to some policy decisions. Um, we looked at in California, they've, in, they've in, uh, increased graduation in uh, largely of their Latino Hispanic population from higher ed in two and four year degrees with some specific policy decisions. So we wanted to lean into that to understand what decisions have been made at the state level, what data were showing us that it was successful and how uh, the sort of Success, the components of that, so if other states are thinking about it, they have a guide, they have a, someone to look to to potentially build their own policy. Um, one of the things we know in this is that we talk a lot about K-12 policy, we might talk about early childhood policy or higher ed policy in very separate silos. But of course, if you're a young person, you travel through all those times, right? Like your experience is very connected as you go through that, that pipeline, so to speak, into young adulthood. And we think it's really important to seek opportunities to better connect what we're doing across that pipeline in policy and in practice, which is why we put all that outcome data in one place. We're not just looking at K-12 outcomes or higher ed outcomes. We're trying to put as much as we can put together um, in this pipeline. And one of the things that we talk about then is the state longitudinal data systems, which I always say is a good way to bore people at a cocktail party to talk about state longitudinal data systems, but that is public data that we've got about what's happening for young people in your state. And it's really important. How do we think about where do we put that? Where do we house it? How do we analyze it? How do we use it and report it back to the public? So it can really help guide decision-making by our policymakers as they try to understand where to start in a really complex landscape. So that's a little bit for you. Um, I hope if you're, if you're sitting in front of your laptop, pull up pipeline.bushcenter.org and you can start to monkey around in there a little bit, particularly if you're a, a data nerd and enjoy yourself. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Really appreciate it. And 
had to switch over to a different device here. So hopefully you can hear me okay and, uh, and see me okay this morning. I, I want to maybe jump in first on the um, on the data piece. And you, you mentioned data systems and sort of why that matters and the tool that, that, the, um, that, that y'all have released. I think many states um, have data systems that are, are in many ways sort of siloed by education level, right? Early yeah. education, K-12 education, higher education. How do you think about breaking down those barriers? How do you think about helping folks across that continuum gain access to the information and data they need? And, and I think maybe just broadly, like, why does that even matter? What, why, is, why is this something that you're sort of spending so much time focused on? What, what's, what's, the, um, what's the sort of impact here that you think matters for, for students in particular? Yes, 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 yes. Um, I'm so glad you asked about this because like I said, really, like it is, it's hard to get people fired up about data and data systems. Like this is what you should be passionate about. Um, but we think this matters so much when we when we talk about state longitudinal data systems. When we started, when I started trying to get smart about this, I was thinking a lot about the technical side, right? Like what kind of cloud system and security do you need to build? And that feels like it's going to cost eleven billion dollars. How on earth are we going to ever resource this with any fidelity over time? And wow, this feels complicated. And is this when you hire out Amazon or something like that? Just, it gets really complicated really fast when you think about the technical side. And I had some friends in state to help me get smarter and think actually the hardest part of this, the technical side we can solve for. There's lots of people who are really good at that. So if you're not in, if you're not in the weeds on that, it feels overwhelming, but that's actually easier to solve given the resources we have in the world. But the hardest thing to do is to come up with governance for how do you manage a system. And that's really where state leaders, advocates, and policymakers have an, have an incredible influence. So what do you want the system to do? What kind of questions do you want to be able to, to ask and answer about what's happening for young people in your state? And when, what does it matter about how those systems connect? Because you're likely going to have to figure out, how do we make our legacy K-12 system talk to our higher ed system? I'm not, I don't want to be naive to that complexity. I know that that's going to, that takes some real effort and time, but it also probably takes the collaboration of potentially chiefs over higher ed or K-12 or early childhood who aren't probably used to having to collaborate on things and share resources in that way or share control. Um, the states that we see that do this the best tend to have a really clear governance structure. It's often in legislation. It's not like an executive order, a task force that one governor does that could be easily undone when the next administration comes in, um, that, that makes it really clear, this is what our data system does, understands it as a public resource, right? It doesn't really belong to anyone, it belongs to all of us. It's our own data about what's happening. Um, and then, and outlines, here's what we wanna know. It's important for us to know. So that's, that's one of the things I think that was important for me to understand when I was starting to really dive into this is that the idea of governance is actually the big elephant in the room, the most exciting, but also potentially the most challenging for a state to take on. So we, all, we also hear, and we've actually had some other guests on these Friday conversations who have spent, I think, particular time thinking about the connection between, in particular, higher education and the workforce. And um, I think uh, uh, perhaps sort of reflecting on the fact that it feels like at a lot of times, there's in a lot of time, uh, times and sort of examples, there's, that there's a disconnect there, right? That, that um, perhaps there are times where what post-secondary is preparing students uh, for is, is at times not aligned with what the workforce needs and that there's, there are challenges with sort of communicating, communicating across that transition point. I'd be curious to hear about how you think about that um, and, and maybe how this work around um, data access and use better state data systems helps to solve for that or could solve from that for that, both from the perspective of post-secondary institutions and also from the workforce in terms of sort of employers better understanding how, how prepared students might be for, for the jobs of the future. Yes. I and mean, this is a big meaty question that is really fun to kind of nerd out about, quite frankly. But I think one of the things that um, disruption, we're in an intensely disrupted time in education, no matter if you're sitting in a, pre a preschool classroom or in a college classroom, right? Like what's happening is sort of being upended. 
that is painful in lots of ways, but typically what happens out of times like that is real innovation emerges from that. And I think we're seeing that and we'll start to see that in five and 10 years as we look back on how higher ed has changed. It will be a, with a clear eye towards value. Like what is, what's the actual value for a student in my program and how do I think about what comes next? So um, I, I, you know, I have a classic sort of liberal arts education in my background. I was an American studies major, which what is that, right? Like you just sort of read a lot of things and think and write and all that, which is good if you end up doing a policy job, but might not have been good if I was going to try to run a hedge fund, right? Like, I don't, you know, there's, there's, there's some trade-offs depending on what you want to do. And I think there's much more clarity from both parents and from kids about what is the actual value of this in terms of what I want to do next. If you think about the question of agency and opportunity, like when I finish this, am I going to have real choice? Am I going to have real choice about what comes next? The higher it is slow, it's a really slow, slow piece of um, like it's, it's slow by design. Things don't happen quickly in an academic setting. You can contrast that to people like Amazon or Google that are building out really robust education programs because they're like, we don't have the people we need with the skills we need to fill the jobs that we have. So guess what? They're going to respond a lot faster to needs in the marketplace than you might see a, a higher ed institution. And that to me is really fascinating to watch that happen. I think entrepreneurial leaders of institutions are wise to partner with companies in that way to help them deliver the kinds of education that they want to stay close to the marketplace. I think that institutions that are able to do that will thrive over time because they've, they're, they're not sort of their own island, right? They're, 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 they're engaging in where their kids are going next. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, the, the demands of the workforce or companies able to respond to their demands and make sure they have their own trained workforce are going to are going to win in this because they're moving quickly to make sure it happens and no one should be surprised by that like i don't have a lot of sympathy necessarily for a leader of a higher ed institution who bemoans that instead of getting kind of curious about it and thinking about well okay the world looks different how do we become part of that faster cycle of education, which will be even more important as we sort of move through the pandemic disruption and we've got lots of people, the great resignation, whether they've sort of been pushed out or stepped away from the workforce and are going to come back potentially in new ways and with different kinds of skills and on a different pathway, right? I think that's ever more important. So I've got two other questions that, that I'll share. And then I know we have lots of questions from folks who have shared thoughts and questions in the, in the chat box. but. Um, I think one of the things that often comes up in these conversations around how to better use data to make decisions in education is, I think, understandably, questions about, about privacy and how we think about uh, ensuring that data is, is used in, in uh, the right ways. How have you thought about that? Are there any things that are top of mind for you around, um, around data privacy as you think about better kind of connecting uh, data across various pieces of sort of the education continuum and then also into, into the workforce. Yeah, it's such an important, it's a really important question, right? Like, um, I think I think there are folks who are, um, uh, who are smarter about this than I am, but I'll say that I know we have got options and solutions around how do you, how do you mask student numbers, right? So you can look at big, big sets of data that help us understand trends and themes like broadly across the system versus what you might be doing at an instructional level in a classroom or on a campus where you need to know, right? Like David, if I'm your student, you need to know that it's me and I'm. this is how I'm performing on certain assessment, right? Like that's a different game. You need to know that it's me because you're gonna be making adjustments differently to make sure I can be successful in the next stage. So I think getting, um, being really transparent with, um, with parents in particular, here's the data that we have, here's how we're using it and when your child's data or your children's data is up in sort of the big system set, it's masked. Like here's how we mask what that is. So you're not losing privacy. You're not, we have, this is how we're, the, the, the policies we've got when we're working with vendors about masking student numbers so that, you know, like there, there are procedures you can do to do this. I think we all live in the real world, right? Like we all get alerts all the time on guess what, your email address or your phone number or this card or whatever was found in the dark web, all that, like we can't, there's no sort of perfect world, but I think we know enough about how to do this in ways that protect 
student and personal privacy, while also giving us really important information about what's happening for kids broadly so that we can make better decisions to resource and support them. All right, last question, and then we're going to turn to some questions that we've gotten in the chat. So um, it, you talked a little bit about this and related to um, sort of data governance and setting the right sort of policies and, and sort of policy climate around this work. Um, if you were advising a policymaker in this work um, on some things that they should be doing or thinking about, um, related to making these connections in more meaningful ways, helping students, you know, using data help to help students make um, make these transitions um, in in um, sort of more intentional and supported ways. What advice would you have, or what tools would you point them to? Maybe. Um, okay, well, this is exciting because we're in the midst of building this decision making tool. I love this plan, David, because I know you've seen a draft of this. But one of the things we are building. Um, to release here that'll come out in a couple of months is we literally call it a decision-making guide, right? This is overwhelming. I think the scope of this sometimes is so overwhelming. It can be hard to know where, where do I start to actually build something that's gonna be effective. So we built a guide that just literally asks you a series of questions. So if you're starting, look at your, look at your data. What, is your, what are your data telling you? How to, if you disaggregate, we've got a bunch of guiding questions because every state, every context is different. So you can figure out what, what do you know based on the data you have? Every state has some. And when you start there, then how do you hone in on, wow, we've got some big gaps in these places. How do I better understand what's behind that? What policies exist in those areas already? What is actually the political landscape? What am I likely to be able to get done and why? And what is the upside to being able to, if we can do this, we think we can accelerate the progress of X number of students, we can serve kids who have not been well served. It, it's literally kind of like a logic tree to help you go through a big, massive data set to hone in on some areas that are likely ripe for real impact and also help you understand, is this something that's feasible? Am I likely to be able to pull it off? Um, it's not, I'd love to say that it's rocket science. It's not, but it's, it's literally how do you take an overwhelming situation and try to simplify it enough to give our policymakers um, a real defensible spot to stand on so that they can help influence their colleagues and explain to them why there's real impact here. They can help uh, educate the people who elected them into office. This is why I think this matters. Here's what I'm hearing from you. Here's what I know now looking at the data that could give us a path forward. That is not like, um, that's, I sound a little bit like a Pollyanna, but I just love our American uh, electoral process and how we make decisions in a policy wise. But I think it, I wanna make sure that policymakers have anchors to be defensible in their policy and that we know how to ask the right kind of questions with an eye to impact. So we're excited about this tool um, that'll be out in a couple in a couple months and we'll be happy to share it with anyone who wants to take a peek. It's simple, awesome. we made it simple by design. <laughs> awesome. All right, I wanna to turn to some questions that we've gotten. Uh, one that came in that I thought was just such a great uh, uh, um, question related to impact for individual students is, I think a lot of the times when we think about uh, about data and and student transitions from education to work, um, it can feel like we're talking about these things at a at a pretty macro level, right? These yeah. are sort of big big systems, lots of data. How, what's the impact here for an individual student? What is having this information, using this information in in better ways? How does that actually impact success for an individual student? It's such a good question. Whoever, whoever asked that, well done. That is a great question. Um, I think about two things, right? Because if you do policy, you have to live in the world of macro. You live in the world of systems. And the important check on that is to value proximity. So who's proximate to the, proximate to the action, right? If you are not in regular contact, regularly checking your ideas with those proximate to that, meaning kids and families, teachers, principals, right? You're gonna get, you'll get really different. You're gonna get personal perspectives on that. But I think people run into trouble when they stay in the macro and they don't, they're not checking with being proximate. That being said, the reason we care about systems, right? The reason policy lives at the systems level is because at the state education is, is governed so much by what happens at the state. 
you have to be able to think about how do we use the resources we bring to bear, all the, the tax dollars, the revenue you've got at the state level to invest back in kids and families. You're gonna make some big macro decisions, right? That's just the way the system works. And I think you can translate that decision-making down into you know, what happens at a school district or um, you know, campus level. But the way I always think about it, if you're gonna be macro, you gotta make sure you have your proximate checks so that you're not, you're not off thinking solely about what the system needs and forgetting any policy is implemented by real human people. <laughs> and that's just as important as what the policy is. If you haven't set it up to actually be implemented in a way that's gonna be meaningful, we're just, you know, rearranging deck chairs, right? Like we, you gotta, you gotta be really thoughtful and really clear eyed about that. Great. Um, next question, uh, someone asked, which I think is a really good question about uh, what uh, data helps us understand um, what students perhaps need or where students are that are beyond, as an example, uh, just academic um, sort of outcomes, right? Are there other things, as you're thinking about these data systems, are there other things uh, beyond academic or even sort of like um, uh, learning sort of outcomes that that feel important to you as you think about these, these, um, these sort of trajectories for students. I think the question actually that somebody asked was like, are there other things in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we need to think about as we think about these, these data, these data uh, systems? It's like the billion dollar question, right? <laughs> and it's such a, the, the, the simple answer is yes, of course, there's things that you would pay attention to if you're thinking about the success of children and the success of young people. I mean, of course, there are lots of things to think about. The challenge is, what do we think the system is responsible for, right? What do we think our system is responsible for? Um, at the Bush Institute, we have a pretty firm stance on paying attention to outcomes rather than inputs. There's a lot of times a temptation in the education system to think about inputs, how much money is going in, do they have, like, what are the right ratios? But it doesn't actually tell us what kids are getting out of that. Um, and I think you have, like where our stance is, you have to be pretty clear on the output side because that's telling you, if you use that, are kids getting what they need? Then of course the, the, the adults need to go back and figure out what's behind either kids who are being successful or not and make some decisions about resourcing, right? Like, so the, that's the way we think about it. If the end goal is kids are learning and are prepared for their next step, that's what we're measuring. If they're not, then our responsibility is to go back in and do, do some decisions. It's not necessarily to measure things like social emotional health, which we think is pretty much impossible to do, quite frankly, with what we know, what we know now. And, um, and that, you know, that's the challenge. That being said, one of the things I'm paying a lot of attention to, particularly when it comes to literacy, is the quality of curriculum and instruction, right? So there are, um, uh, we can't pretend that doesn't matter, the actual quality of what is used in the classroom, the rigor of what is used in the classroom, what kids are exposed to, um, and the quality of instruction that matters enormously, right? And one of the, uh, and that's, and we haven't quite nailed down how to measure that in a way that's that's sort of succinct, put it that way. And how do you put the right incentives in the system so that people are using the best stuff? Um, and I, but I, that's a really interesting and important question for me. All right, I want to shift gears. Uh, we've got about ten minutes left here. I want to shift gears. And to talk about a, a, an issue that's very connected to data and data systems, but but maybe even in some ways is is a bit um, broader, and that's about accountability in education. And you talked about outcomes, obviously, as being sort of the key um, thing yeah. that we're we we should be looking at. Um, I think certainly, as as folks who are joining us know, um, who are in Tennessee, um, you know, strong and focused accountability systems has really been a kind of a. a, a, a key um, priority for, for Tennessee over the last decade plus. Um, and I know this year, I believe, is the 20th anniversary of No Child Left Behind. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, thinking right now about how do we both um, continue to commit to 
to strong accountability for, for outcomes for students in education, and also continue to evolve and learn based on what's worked and what hasn't, you know, over the last 20 years. And so I know this is a big question, and we could probably have a whole, um, uh, a whole session just on this topic, but would be curious about how you're thinking about that question. Where, where do we go next, or where should we go next based on what we've learned over the last 20 years? And, and I think really, how do we do that in a way that that continues to prioritize the importance of, of to your point earlier, outcomes and, and really um, accountability for um, for results in terms of um, making sure that students are prepared for, for the future. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, January 8th, uh, for those of you paying attention, was the 20th anniversary of NCLB. So the couple of things that I would, I would um, flag about that. One, to have a little bit of nostalgia, because that was one of the last big bipartisan federal pieces of federal legislation was NCLB. Um, and I think it, we sort of look back on a time when Congress was working and passed this with lots of, of course, there was a lot of negotiating and horse training, but that was the bipartisan bill, um, which is kind of incredible to think back on uh, the 20 years that there really hasn't been one that with quite as much heft um, uh, to it. The reason we think um, we're big fans of NCLB, there might not be some on the on the call who would agree. And the things that we think about, why I'll tell you why I care so much about it. Number one, we didn't have disaggregated data before NCLB. We could not rely on disaggregated data to see what was happening for kids in all races um, and subgroups. Before then, it was a little bit haphazard. And we know that all manner of sins are lost when you average out at a campus level. And you can say, oh, our kids are doing fine. They look like they're doing fine. When in fact, some of your kids are doing great and some are probably not doing well. And that's a really important legacy, I think, of NCLB. One of the things that I think was what we learned so much about NCLB in doing the, um, uh, with, the, with this sort of what was turned into that kind of the high stakes accountability is that somehow along the line, people misunderstood accountability as the intervention. And accountability was just the measure, right? So it wasn't just because we had accountability, you'd suddenly see things that were different because of the accountability system. It was literally showing you what was happening and then it was incumbent upon the adults to make different decisions to serve kids, right? Like that was somehow that got all like messed up, you know, in there and it turned into, we hate tests and tests are terrible and, um, and it really revealed a, a few things. Sometimes that, that people will default to gamesmanship when they felt they didn't have other choices or they didn't know what to do, right? There was places where they just thought, I don't have the resources, I don't know how to do this. I don't, you know, like I feel a lot of pressure for whatever reason, who knows what's all behind that, but we saw lots of gamesmanship around how to hit the right numbers without actually making sure the spirit of that law, which was to ensure the success of all kids, was met. And there's probably some things, it also revealed, we don't have enough um, capacity in the system to intervene in high quality ways, right? Like there was a lot of kids, a lot of campuses that probably needed additional support. We just didn't have the capacity in the system to respond effectively. So I think those are two really, really important lessons to take. How do we take what is great about NCLB, disaggregated data saying it's important that we believe all kids can learn and succeed. We fundamentally deeply believe that at the Bush Institute and it requires that we measure with high quality measures. But what do we know? We gotta figure out how to manage that capacity around resourcing and we had to figure out how to provide the right incentives for people that are better than gamesmanship, right? Just they're better than hitting the numbers we're actually gonna be able to serve kids. So what I think going forward, the things that I'm really intrigued about is not how do we make accountability more complex because I think more people will just keep falling out of the back of the bandwagon because it's, when it's too complex, no one really gets it. But how do we strengthen people's understanding of assessment? Assessment is not a dirty word, it's not terrible. We all use assessment and everything is important measures of what kids learn so that teachers and principals have a better understanding of assessment. We don't have these weird summative tests that never really seem to connect back to campuses, right? Those were designed to be system checks, not instructional tools, but it's clear we need the instructional assessment as well that seems connected for teachers. So I think there's a real opportunity around capacity, a real opportunity around simplifying and, and using assessment data differently so that parents and teachers understand it, that hopefully give us some anchors on to here's how we keep strong accountability that has a kid focus going forward. So that was a lot, but 
we could talk more about that at my next dinner party. Also exciting. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Maybe we'll have a future conversation just focused on this question, which yeah. I know is a lot for for uh, for uh, for for one just one question. So I want to turn to our last question, and and, and this yeah. is a question we've been asking everyone who's joined us for these uh, for these conversations. Um, and it's really a little bit of uh, prognostication, sort of looking ahead. What should we be uh, thinking about? What should we be looking forward to? What should we be concerned about as we think about sort of the future of, of education improvement? And so I think the big question is, if we were to look back 20 years from now, yeah. um, what do you predict or maybe what do you hope will be the biggest uh, or most important change um, in education in, in either K-12, post-secondary, workforce preparedness. Um, what, what do you, what do you, uh, what do you predict, or maybe what do you hope for as we think about? I'm going to go with hope, David. I want to be an, I want to have some optimism. Great. Um, uh, so when I think about what I really hope for, is I hope I have two things. One is an outcomes thing, and one is a systems thing. One uh, on the outcome side, I hope we have some really clear pathways for young people to see opportunity ahead of them. Meaning the two and four year degrees that we have, those are not going away, but that we have real clarity in this sort of newer, exciting world around credentials and certificates that are putting young people into really high wage earning jobs. This is sort of getting us out of that like blue collar, white collar divide. Like I just think all that's gonna kind of go away and we're gonna have some real clear paths to opportunities so that we don't have it would be rare to have a young person who looks forward and can't see themselves somewhere with real opportunity. And that's gonna look differently than we have what that looks like now. But I, that's, that's a real hopeful prediction for me. The second one is that we figure out how to have more strong capacity in the system. I know yesterday in Tennessee, you all had an exciting announcement around how do we train and develop more teachers, which is incredibly exciting when people think about ways to make that barrier to entry really low and encourage more, more people to get into education um, and that we're not sort of glad for anyone who chooses us, but it's a really good place for people to be. We need that capacity in the system if we're serious about kids. Great, I love that optimism at, uh, at, at the end of the week here too. So thanks so much, yeah. Ian. So, um, I know we said we were going to keep these sessions to 45 minutes. We want to really uh, be um, intentional about respecting everyone's busy day on a, on a Friday morning. But thank you so much, Anne, for, for being with us, for sharing um, the work that you're doing, uh, for really sharing sort of the energy, I think, and, and, and um, kind of focus around this particular um, work. Really looking forward to staying updated on the work that's coming, the tools that you mentioned I know are coming out in, in the future. Um, and before we close, just want to let folks know our next session uh, will be Friday, February 11th. We'll be joined again by, um, I know what will be an amazing guest uh, who will join us for a conversation. More coming on that soon. Um, look for the registration info around that session coming soon, as well as the um, link to the video from today. We'll be sharing that over email and on our YouTube page. Um, and just want to say thanks again to everyone for joining us. And thank you again for your time today. Hope everyone has a great day, a great weekend, and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you again. Bye, everyone.